I think empathy is the first step towards getting the spec um, and really understanding, you know, your, your customer. Welcome to the Smarter Building Materials Marketing Podcast, helping you find better ways to grow leads, sales, and outperform your competition. All right, everybody, welcome to Smarter Building Materials Marketing, where we believe your online presence should be your best salesperson. I am Zach Williams, alongside my co-host, Beth Popniklov. And today we've got a great show lined up for you today. We are really excited to welcome Greg Roll. He is the principal of the Role Model and Family founded Roll Faucets. Greg, we are so excited that you are here. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm very excited to join you. Thank you. So Greg, for our listeners, give us a little bit of your background, what you do, and then we'll dive into talking a little bit about how people can be more effective in their marketing and sales. Sure. Well, as best noted, uh, I've, our family role uh, established uh, Roll LLC back in 1982. That was the, the company was started by uh, our father, Ken, and my brother, Lou. And then another brother, Mark, joined. Uh, and then I came on board officially in 1993. Uh, and over the years, you know, the, the company grew from really introducing, notably, the first pull-out faucet, which was a, a new thing back in 1982. Uh, but uh, along with that, it was uh, a level of European quality and design that, particularly in the plumbing, in decorative plumbing category, uh, had really been seen before. It was pretty much considered a, a, you know, a kind of a commodity market. And there were a few sort of decorative uh, faucet lines, but they were more on the bath side, and they kind of evolved out of hardware companies. But um, when my father just sort of discovered uh, this uh, product line over at a trade show in Germany, uh, he realized there was a, an opportunity in the marketplace and the company he was with wasn't really interested in, in working you know, with uh, a real high-end manufacturer. And in fact, the, the message back to him when he suggested introducing this product under their label was, you know, no one will ever spend $250 on a kitchen faucet. You know, at that time, he might spend 50 to 75 if that was really you know, high-end. So the idea of, of introducing a product line that was four to five times higher than and the kind of the standard was uh, a risk. But I think he, he understood at that time European products, particularly appliances and cabinetry, and kind of that Euro style was starting to come into the larger metro markets like New York Metro and Los Angeles. And so he, he moved uh, our family from Chicago to Southern California and started that business. And really, you know, he, he left the, the former company and he was an entrepreneur at 48, 49. When we think back on, on that scene, you know, the, the office was the spare bedroom, the warehouse was the trunk of the car, uh, and he'd literally fill up the trunk of the car and uh, head out and, and place these products in the marketplace. And fortunately, he had been, you know, in the uh, building materials uh, industry for many years, and particularly focused on, on kitchen uh, so he knew uh, the showrooms, the kitchen and bath designers, and so uh, and he knew the marketplace across the country. So he really had the strategy in mind. Uh, he may have not had a lot of uh, resources, let's say, at the beginning, but he had the experience uh, and the confidence uh, and the uh, and the right product, I think, at the right time. And also, as I, I mentioned before, you know, at that time, you know, he was really catching what we call kind of this boomer wave. You know, that generation was just starting to enter its, you know, home formation years, you know, late 20s, early 30s. And, you know, really so well positioned, you know, very, uh, that was a wealthy generation. Uh, they were interested in luxury. You know, this was the early 80s. So that kind of conspicuous consumption was, you know, a little bit more the style. And, uh, and that the force of that, that generation uh, and that the strength of their kind of that buying power uh, and their focus on home and particularly kitchen and bath so certainly buoyed you know our company early on and through the years and through the you know the various trials and tribulations and uh, successes and setbacks but I think the whole industry and that that kind of luxury market within kitchen and bath grew from what might have been you know single digits into you know healthy kind of, you know, teens, maybe even going towards 
20 percent um, uh, in the late 90s so or actually up until the great recession you know um, but we were able to build back and uh, it was just an, it's an amazing kind of uh, journey from one product to you know sourcing from over 20 different factories from Western Europe uh, through North America and even New Zealand we had some partners there too so it's been a great uh, great experience and, and I think the the lessons learned really uh, are both uh, kind of the art and the science of business. And I think a lot of you know, times, I think as you were saying before, it's if people want to focus kind of on the process and product and, and data. And I think there's a real human side. Um, as I was telling someone the other day, I think empathy is the first step towards getting the spec uh, and really understanding, you know, your, your customer and, and, you know, being, hungry, you know, you, you want to achieve, you want to you know, be successful, but I think you also have to be humble and, you know, really listen um, and understand what's motivating your, your customer, whether that's in a, a, a B2B or, or a B2C. There's so much good information. I hardly know where to start. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there, right? That was awesome. That was awesome. What I want to ask you Greg, is you know, you've seen the life cycle of a building product manufacturer go from startup in your second bedroom to international manufacturer. I'd really, and, I, and you said something else a minute ago about how empathy is impo- you know, really the yeah. cornerstone of, I forget how you said it, but the cornerstone of getting the spec. Talk to me about marketing, sales, and how to get in the spec. You know, as you've seen the life cycle of, of role, What's changed and as well as what are some like tried and true tactics for manufacturers to learn from if they want to grow their sales and specifically grow specifications? Sure. Uh, well, one of the things we like to, to do in our, in our company, uh, I think my dad having that kind of corporate background and, and he would call himself a, a corporate tenure, <laughs> a kind of combination. He had the entrepreneurial spirit, but a corporate training and a lot of those tools really came in handy, uh, both internally, you know, no matter what, whatever size of the business, again, if you're just starting out, uh, but also in communicating with, you know, our own teams, our sales teams, and then ultimately our customers. Uh, one of those things would be, you know, the use of, of formulas and ac- acronyms and um, the one like D, P, and E. <laughs> come to mind whereas D is, is differentiated so you know from a product standpoint uh, making sure that you have a story of differentiation you know that you know whether it's a, a, a functional uh, improvement um, you know better quality at a at same price or a lower price um, whatever what's what's the unique you know kind of backstory and uh, what's the origin story behind your product or your service for that matter uh, P is always profitability, um, you know, particularly the B2B, you know, our uh, company, we sold through distribution, so different channels, but at each step, there had to be uh, a story of profitability in working with our product line. Um, and, you know, and, and that extended, you know, it had to be profitable for our sales team. You know, we had uh, most of our representatives were independent reps, right? So they're working on commission. So obviously that had to be worth their while to go out and advocate and support, particularly a new product line. Um, and then, you know, in the showroom, obviously the person, who, the owner, the manager, they need to see that your program is profitable um, and worth investing, you know, time and space in a, in a, in a retail environment. And, and the people selling the product, you know, on the showroom floor. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of you know benefits and, and stiff programs and that kind of thing that are pretty typical, but uh, they need to see that when they're working with that product, it's it's a profit, it's a benefit to them. Uh, the specifier, so talking about the spec, has to see a benefit in selecting your product over uh, something else. So there has to be something compelling about it. So again, either you know, in a building material sense, I can imagine that, you know, see either it performs better, it's easier to work with, it's a more dependable, you know, from a sourcing standpoint, um, better service. Obviously, your, your service team has to be, you know, second to none, and that makes a huge difference. So you get the greatest product, but if you're, the, the, the team in the field isn't uh, well supported and keeping promises, 
um, that that product's going to get you know set aside for another another selection. So then finally E, and that, that kind of leads into this E being easy. You know, your, your product has to be easy to work with, uh, easy to specify. You know, ideally, if it's if it's something that um, I mean, end user is also seeing, it has to be easily um, attractive, uh, whether it's a design or a function. Um, and then that easy also goes back to the profitability. So, you know, if I'm selling uh, a brand or specifying a brand, let's say the product uh, or the money I make is money I keep because, you know, there are no after sale issues. Or if there is a need for after sale service, it's second to none. And again, you know, I'm, I'm not going back and kind of giving back that profitability in having to deal with, you know, any kind of issues after this, after the sale. So again, that's, I think, a very general um, approach to, I think, how, how one succeeds. Um, you know, getting into the marketing of, of brands, our, our product line, as I mentioned, was considered a luxury brand. We built uh, the company around sort of this luxury uh, strata within the kitchen and bath world. We had to become very good storytellers. And that's where I think the, the power of story uh, is really important. And it, it, not just with a, a decorative product, but I think any product, um, having a real sense of you know, its uh, origin, uh, the de development. Um, we had the, the, the great fortune of dealing with factories that were in beautiful parts of you know, Western Europe. You know, many of our factories are in, in the north of Italy. And it's actually nice, known as right? the village of Fawcett's, Laga de Orta. Um, <laughs> it's about an hour north of Milan. And it's and kind of getting up the mountains. It's a lake region. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's also very historically connected with um, metalwork. Um, Alessi, if you know the brand Alessi, they're based there. Uh, there's a, a lot of, um, and it may have been because of the resources in the area or the ability of, of access to water. But there was a, a, a real generational tradition of working with metal and brass. And so, you know, the, the plumbing industry, there are a number of different factories, both commercial products as well as decorative products, and you know, people do components uh, in that area. So there was a lot of, of storytelling uh, that we, we had access to, which again, made it a compelling uh, for, again, the end user, the specifier. Uh, we had product in, you know, in England, uh, we have two fa two factories or, or companies based in England, Parent Row and Shaw's Original, which are now part of House of Roll as well. And again, wonderful you know stories of you know both engineering and artistry, uh, authentic uh, original designs. Uh, the the Shaw's story is really interesting. You know, it, it's a company that goes back to late 1800s and uh, making fire clay sinks, you know, the, the apron front sinks, which are so popular now and have been, uh, they still make them, you know, kind of by hand. And it's still a, a really special product with a lot of, of human uh, effort that goes into it. So again, that's something compelling. And that brand, you know, I'd say one of the things that we also learned over the years was that, you know, Roll essentially became a brand, but Originally, we were a sales and marketing company uh, and a distribution company, and we evolved over time, and we learned uh, a couple lessons that uh, you know, we, we had to be our own brand. Roll, there is no factory with Roll uh, you know, above the door. Uh, we were working with other manufacturers, some of which um, had great stories, but you know, trying to incorporate all their brands you know, wouldn't necessarily be, it would be more confusing, so Roll was always top, top of line. Uh, but other companies, like a Parent Row or a Shaw's, their brand story was so authentic and contributed so well to their story and to their value uh, that we we utilized that. Uh, and eventually, that that Shaw's original, the the, the, the sinks are distinguished by a, a kind of a blue diamond says Shaw's original, you know, um, 1897. And uh, people would look for that, particularly mm -hmm. as you know, commodity or things are. You know, other products come in and try to, you know, offer this that look for a, a lower price. Uh, people would say, "No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step up. I'll spend more for the the Shaw's sink with that blue diamond, because that's the original and that's what I want in my kitchen." So, uh, 
okay, and finding the balance between, uh, you know, when to highlight uh, brands within you know that have great stories. If you're if you're offering you know multiple products, um, and when to make sure that the the main focus is on on your brand. Uh, I think it would be another lesson learned. I'd love to dig in a little more about what you're saying about story. We are big believers in story and it's something that comes up again and again, especially for products that could potentially be positioned as commodities. Story becomes even more important. But specifically, Greg, I'd love to get your, uh, your experience with how, from a role, from roles perspective, you've solved a problem or at least you're solving the problem that a lot of manufacturers have, which is you have multiple product lines, multiple product families, and multiple audiences that mm -hmm. each of those product lines are speaking to. Could you right. talk to us a bit about how you take those into consideration? How are you speaking to everyone but keeping a very clear message at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, balancing act. Um, and I think, A, it's, it's understanding uh, who all the end users are or who all the, the stakeholders are, uh, you know, within your, your distribution channel down to the end user. Um, and again, that's where that empathy, I think, comes in and, and really, you know, taking the time to understand, you know, you know big brands off, oftentimes will, will do, you know, customer, will de develop customer personas, you know, and that's a typical more of a consumer brand um, process. But I think it's well worth, um, even on the, the building product side, that we think in, in, in those terms. And one of the things that we did over the years that I think helped distinguish us was looking at the lessons that other product, uh, say luxury categories uh, employed and, and saying, how do we take those approaches and, and use them in, in our world? Because ultimately we're all selling to the same customer. You know that luxury consumer might be, yeah. you know, buying fashion or clothing or jewelry or travel uh, or you know dining out. The, all those those were our competition. You know, we looked within our industry and we had a lot of our conversations with, let's say, our our friends within the National Kitchen and Bath Association, for instance. And I remember very early on, the message was, you know, the competition isn't necessarily the the showroom across town or even that display next to yours in the showroom. It's really the other uh, ways people might spend their money instead of you know upgrading their kitchen, uh, right? So uh, kind of understanding that, and that was not, was really fun to, to employ once we talk about this language of luxury. So for us, uh, it was looking outside of our world and seeing you know, what, that, what was appealing uh, to that, uh, that buyer in other uh, in other uh, areas of their life, and uh, bring that into to our story. Uh, kind of getting back to the you know when you're dealing with different products and different uh, levels of price point, and perhaps sub brands. Uh, again, having a clear idea of who each you know of those brands is uh, serving, and I think developing the stories for each of them very clearly, uh, and making making sure that. that those stories are well, um, they're well documented and they're shareable and they're clear uh, all the way down the line. I think, you know, in our world, we could have the, the best collateral, we could have the most compelling, you know, language and, and we, and, you know, the, the role family and our, our, our extended family of our company, we could speak that language very fluently. But the reality is that, you know, the, the sale we're not there when that uh, designer uh, or that builder is standing in that showroom. They're standing with, you know, whoever's working in the showroom. So, how, are they capable of, of telling your story well? And uh, and that's something that you know it, it's hard to do. But the the clearer the message it can be, and consistently uh, broadcast out across all of the. Uh, stages or positions of of selling and specifying uh, is something that people really need to focus on uh, and then that balancing of of this you know, when you have sub brands versus um, you know you're gonna say your company brand uh, you know we we learned a, a tough lesson early on when uh, 
my father started the business. Uh, you know, he envisioned it really as a sales and marketing you know business. It wasn't about creating a branded uh, product. The, the the product was the star, and that that product's brand was the one that we promoted. Hmm. And for the first ten years of our company, we were very successful, and that brand became very well known. Uh, and at some point, you know, they severed the relationship with us. So when they said we're not going to renew the contract, everyone knew that brand uh, in the marketplace, let's say from a specifier standpoint. Uh, and that was gosh, 70, 80% of our revenue <laughs> with that one product. And so we had to re kind of invent ourselves. And fortunately, again, the, our, our company had a great, uh, had built great trust with our, our customer base. And so they, again, that relationship, we were given great opportunities as we started to bring in new products and create new relationships. Uh, we found we found a home and a, and a venue to, to promote them. And again, that, that you know, good customer service that we were known for um, and that good sense of understanding and, you know, our clients' needs and, and concerns uh, really uh, paid dividends in creating opportunities for us. But never again, we would, you know, as we, we started then to really you know, conceive of the company as a, as a brand and, and really talk about the role brand. Um, and there were, you know, and role, it, it kind of evolved over the years. I mean, you know, you, you don't build a brand overnight. Brand is not something you can, you can't buy a brand. You know, uh, you have to earn, you build a brand. And it was 30 some years of us, you know, doing what we did and doing the right things day in and day out. Um, and just, you know, the, the brand gets built incrementally. It's, it's really built on a foundation of, of trust, right? And, uh, and eventually, you know, we, we were always marketing. I think we were always speaking to uh, not only our you know, B2B, but we always had an eye on the B2C. Uh, but being a relatively small company, we always invested in marketing, uh, but we just didn't have a big advertising budget. But we looked at it as, you know, it wasn't about just creating overwhelming, you know, consumer reach. It was also about showing that investment. Uh, we, we would call it merchandising the advertising because it was, a, it was a signal back to our customers that we were investing in our own brand. We were investing uh, for them. We wanted to create, you know, a, a pull as well as, you know, the push through their distribution channel. And that was something that, that ultimately, I think, helped differentiate us and, and help build our brand with our uh, distribution partners over the years. And, you know, again, would be, you know, would help uh, that be a go-to, uh, where Roll would be a go-to product because, hey, they're, they're investing in, you know, you know, speaking to that end user, uh, speaking to that designer, creating some awareness uh, of the brand. And uh, even, you know, <laughs> early on, I think the first ad that my father ever purchased was in Architectural Digest. Now, that sounds pretty major. But at the time, uh, Art Digest had what they called a California edition. So it was just, they would, they had, you know, you could do a section of advertising that was distributed just within the California market. So as opposed to being a $45,000 ad, it was maybe a $5,000 ad. Right? Good deal. Right, good deal. <laughs> and of course, the distribution was obviously much, much limited. Now, we were based in Southern California, so that kind of made sense. But what we did was we... Part of the deal is like, you know, give us lots of extra copies of the magazine. So let's say you get 50, 7,500 copies of the magazine. And then we sent them all to Chicago and New York and Florida and said, gave them to our reps that go out and give, put, you know, walk into your showrooms and say, here's Architectural Digest and look at, you know, role is advertising in Architectural Digest to create awareness. And we might not have said that it was just showing up in California, but I mean, it showed that we were, you know, we were, we were doing our part. Um, and I think that was something that we always uh, made a point to make sure that, you know, you, you didn't invest in marketing without making sure that everyone in the sales uh, structure was aware. And again, that was also that part of educating uh, them to, to be speaking that same language. And uh, again, that's something incremental, but again, over time, that really uh, helped help build the brand. This has been super helpful 
Greg. I, I really appreciate you sharing all this information. Um, yeah. If someone wants to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, sure. They can email me, uh, Greg at the role model. That's R O H L model.com. Or I've got a website, uh, the role model.com as well. That's great. Excellent. And for our listeners out there, if you want more great content like this, go to venvio.com slash podcast. Until next time, I'm Zach Williams alongside Beth Popnikolov. Thanks, everybody.